We are going to continue with the video conferencing. In the last class, we had seen some uh, ISDN uh, based configuration, okay, which is essentially a circuit switched uh, technology. And uh, in this lecture, we will just uh, show you some one or two other alternative um, techniques of connections. Okay. And uh, then we go over mainly to the session initiation protocol or the SIP, okay, which is the protocol that one uses in order to establish a video conferencing session. Okay, the um, setup as well as the tear down, they are defined by a protocol. Okay. In fact, one can use the H.323, okay, especially whenever one needs uh, the interface between the PSTN and the IP and SIP is uh, purely an IP based protocol. Okay. It does not uh, uh, assume or does not uh, necessitate any uh, a priori connection setup, I mean be it a real connection or a virtual connection. So, this is what we are going to cover today and uh, before we go over to the actual topic. Uh, let me make a mention about uh, one or two important references which you can um, go through in order to uh, learn further about these uh, techniques and whatever I have covered or going to cover are mostly based on uh, these papers. So, this is uh, the first paper that you can refer to is that apart from the uh, Burr Goods paper which I have already referred to you that uh, that is regarding the voice over IP, okay. even for voice over IP as well as for the video conferencing, you can refer to the paper by Hong Liu and Petro Muktaris. Both of them are from uh, Telecordia Technologies. In fact, Telecordia Technologies uh, are the uh, ones who had participated actively in the development of the H.323 and this is voice over IP signaling. So, this gives you fairly detailed idea about H.323. Some of it you can get from Burgood's paper and also from this one H.323 and beyond. So, when they talk about beyond they also cover the SIP protocol, which I will be discussing mainly today. And this paper appeared in IEEE communications magazine. This is not a transaction paper, this is a magazine paper. So, it, it should be easy to understand for all of you. The page number is 142 to 148 and it uh, appeared in IEEE communications magazine October 2002, uh, no October 2000 sorry. This is October 2000 and in the same issue actually this is a special issue on the advanced signaling and control in the next generation networks. Okay, that is the special issue October 2000 and in the same issue you should refer to a paper by uh, H. Schulz Rehn in fact Schulz Rehn is from Columbia University they had contributed to the 
Development of SIP and Jonathan Rosenberg. The title of the paper is the session initiation protocol. So, they are going to talk in details about the SIP. And it is the internet centric signaling. So, the same source that is IEEE communication magazine October 2000, the page numbers for this one is 134 to I think this is the paper just before this. So, 134 to 141 is this one that is on the SIP and then followed by this. Uh, from page number 142, just the next page onwards, you will get voice over IP signaling H.323 and beyond. So, I, I suggest that uh, uh, you should refer to this uh, to references okay, in order to get a better feel about uh, these uh, techniques. Uh, so, let me go over to the discussions about the voice over uh, the, the uh, uh, ISDN based video conferencing. In fact, I was showing you two alternative configurations mainly. One is uh, the one that uses the uh, small office configuration or where we use the BRI method of connections. Okay. The other is that where we can have a medium office configuration which would use large number of um, uh, terminal endpoints. Okay. And it, it should be in turn connected to the access switch and the access switch will be connected to the PSTN network using the PRI interface. So, that PRI would actually be shared by all the terminal equipments which are there within the establishment. The idea is that uh, I mean one can uh, ask for or negotiate for uh, any bandwidth okay, within 1.544 megahertz. So, if bandwidth is available one can go in for a high bandwidth video conferencing in fact and one has to reserve the resource accordingly. So, the, this is what is possible using the PRI. So, PRI has got some uh, distinct advantage as I mentioned about the uh, I mean about much less cable requirement because whatever cabling you have to do mainly within the office, but outside the office it is only the um, uh, I mean PRI which uh, carries the traffic okay. and then uh, obviously, less cabling means improved reliability and the dynamic bandwidth allocation which was not possible in the case of the um, uh, BRI type of uh, interface okay. because there we had to use dedicated BRI links to that okay. and uh, the ability to make hard bandwidth calls. and. Uh, redundancy. So, these are some of the issues okay, which gives the uh, alternative configuration an advantage. Okay. And uh, what I want to show you is uh, mainly a large office configuration okay. and in the case of large office configuration uh, for the ISDN video conferencing essentially what we look for in a large office is that the system should not be down because of uh, I mean internal factors as well as for external factors. Now, one, one thing which you uh, see there is uh, that uh, if the if, if supposing the um, uh, access switch that fails in the case of the ISDN video conferencing if the access switch fails in, in that case the whole system comes to a standstill. Okay. So, we should have some redundancy at the switch level and not only that it uh, comes to the question of network also that uh, supposing you are registered with one company, one telephone company and their cable gets down due to some reason, okay, some uh, weather uh, conditions, I mean some natural disasters or something like that because of which 
one company's uh, telephone network is down. And if you have the connectivity with another company, then you can also have some kind of a redundancy so that uh, one can uh, establish an alternative path. So, in fact, we can uh, think of a configuration like this that say we have a switch over here and then uh, this is what is external to the switch that means to say that outside the establishment and within the establishment we will be having a number of terminal endpoints okay, which are connected to this switch okay. and in a very similar way what I had already shown and these are all the internal PRIs. So, these are the internal PRI and here we will be having the external PRI, external PRI and this is connected to the PSTN. So, up to this it is nothing new to us because we had already seen this type of configuration, but in order to have a redundancy what we should have, have is that not all these uh, terminal endpoints we should be connecting to the, this switch. Okay. In fact, we should uh, have a connectivity with uh, another switch and some other terminal equipments of the same establishment may be connected to the second switch. Okay. So, the second switch serves as a redundancy and you can use the external PRI for that and use a separate PSTN network means if this is provided by company A, okay, this may be coming from company B. So, that uh, even if company A's network is down, you have company B's network running. Okay. And in fact, these switches can be internally connected together using PRI link. So, that the advantage is that if uh, supposing PSTN A is down, then uh, you get the full connectivity in the sense that the if PSTN B is up, in that case all the terminal equipments which are there in this uh, segment okay, as well as which are in this segment can make use of the PSTN B network okay, and vice versa in case of PSTN B failure it can go to the PSTN A. Okay. So, uh, this is the large affix configuration that uh, uh, one can have okay, building in some amount of redundancy in the configuration okay. and in fact, when it uh, comes to enterprise to enterprise connectivity okay, one can not only use the PRI and go through a PSTN network, but many a times I mean for very um, uh, uh, what you can say I mean for very urgent and uh, for uh, very strategic communication okay, one uh, may not be depending upon the telephone network or rather uh, I mean the establishments from one office to another okay, like say for example, if we are talking of a big um, uh, banking organization, okay, supposing their one office is located at New York and another office is located in London okay, and this New York office and London office, they need to have their uh, communication, their video conferencing, voice over IP and all these things. They want their links to be up. So, what they should do is that they should not only have the uh, PSTN network, but as a backup they should have the T1 link okay, which will be uh, dedicated to the organization okay, and they can connect between themselves. So, if, if it is organizations uh, branch office located at a place okay, connected to a, an access switch over here and then we have the PSTN network and then it goes to another location okay, that means to say they are another office. Okay, they are another branch and this is internally connected like this okay. and, and in addition to PSTN one can also have a dedicated T1 link okay. and T1 link as you know that T1 link could offer you a bandwidth of 1.544 megabits per second which is fairly uh, good enough okay, for the video conferencing. Okay. So, in fact your video conferencing can still be up by using this dedicated T1 link. So, this many times the uh, big uh, banking establishments, uh, insurance companies they can uh, use this sort of a dedicated links and also 
especially in uh, today's context, okay, people need to have the connectivity even if they are in the ISDN connectivity, okay, they should also have a uh, connectivity with the IP. So, they should have a gateway or rather what you can mention as the IP to ISDN gateway, okay, so that they can have the connectivity with both IP as well as the ISDN. So, there one can have configuration like this. So, using the IP oblique ISDN gateways and video bridges. In fact, uh, I mean in the last class, I was uh, showing you about the uh, different uh, types, I mean typical examples of connections which the MCUs or what is known as the multi-point control units, okay, they can realize, okay, like I have shown you the uh, broadcast type of configuration, I can show, uh, I mean I had also shown you the one-to-one -one connectivity, then also shown you the combination, okay, where several streams can be put together into a one bundled stream, okay, and then uh, distributed to others. So, uh, all, all these things, okay, the MCUs are also referred to in many of the literatures as, as video bridges. So, do not get confused by the term because many a times uh, while reading the journals or references, you may f come across the term video bridges, okay. So, do not do not think that is it is it anything new. Video bridges are of course, the uh, same as the video MCUs. So, in fact, what you can have as the IP ISDN gateways and video uh, bridges, the configuration could be like this, that supposing you have a switch, okay, that is the same access switch that I am talking of, okay, and uh, to this you are having the terminal endpoints and then you have uh, uh, connectivity with the PSTN network, okay. And uh, then uh, you can have links which are connected to a video MCU. So, this is a video MCU and the video MCU could also be connected to a LAN, okay. So, because the MCU is the ultimate controller, okay, you need the MCU connected to this, not only eventually it should be connected to these terminal endpoints, okay, but also to the LAN. So, this is where I have the LAN and then we should have an IP to ISDN gateway, IP ISDN gateway, okay, and the IP to ISDN gateway would again be connected to the switch, so that one can establish ultimately a connectivity between the PSTN and the LAN and in fact, more and more organizations are today preferring with this uh, mode of configuration because uh, uh, I mean although uh, many companies, okay, who require a video conferencing, they had invested lot of money in uh, building up the ISDN video conferencing facility, but today seeing the growth of the IP based video conferencing, okay, people also cannot suddenly switch over from the ISDN to IP. So, what they build up is the IP ISDN gateways, okay, and uh, try to have a connectivity with the IP as well, okay. So, in order to have the, uh, have a proper connectivity with the IP, what you essentially require, uh, require is an efficient uh, signaling techniques. In fact, signaling techniques we have already come across. Uh, when we talked about the H.323 and especially within H.323, we also studied the uh, signaling uh, protocol which is um, actually used in the ISDN, okay. But uh, uh, in, in this case for the session initiation protocol or SIP, we are uh, primarily concerned with the uh, advanced signaling and control functionality of multimedia services, okay, in the uh, IP network, okay. And it is not only used for advanced signaling and control, although that is the purpose, 
okay, that it is used for advanced signaling and control over the IP networks, okay. but uh, it can also be used for things like uh, instant messaging, okay, generating alerts, event notifications, all these things, uh, the, the same SIP can be used. In fact, SIP, I mean, when I describe it, uh, you will be finding that it is a very attractive kind of protocol, okay, just like the way the HTTP is, okay. in fact, HTTP, uh, the hypertext uh, transfer protocol, it is a text based uh, protocol, okay. I mean all the uh, signaling, they are text based and uh, very similarly for the session initiation protocol also, it is a text based uh, transfer of messages, okay. although it is strictly not a transfer protocol okay, in the sense that it is only used, I mean such text based um, uh, signaling is only used for the connection setup, but once the connection has been established, okay, the rest of the things uh, uh, or rather the media streams have to go through the RTP. Okay. So, now uh, primarily, I mean although you will find a lot of similarity between the features of the SIP with uh, that of the um, um, PSTN or ISDN signaling that we have already studied, okay. but the main and the major difference that you will come across is that uh, unlike the PSDN or ISDN, uh, this signaling technique does not require any reservation of the resources okay. and it never assumes any a priori connectivity, okay, be it a real connection or a virtual connection. Okay. So, this is one uh, major aspect that it does not reserve any resource, that is one of the major feature, does not reserve resource. Or assume real or virtual connections. Now, uh, SIP, um, I mean this being a protocol architecture has to necessarily use some other architectural support, some other protocol architectural supports as well. Okay, so, uh, what are this that the SIP architecture this includes the following protocols. One is the RTP, okay, which is used for the transportation, the actual media packets, transportation, sorry, transportation, and uh, then uh, uh, it uses another protocol which is called as the RTSP. The full form of it is the real time streaming protocol, streaming protocol okay. and this is for on demand media streams. And then it uses the MGCP. You must not have forgotten MGCP, I mentioned few classes back. That is the Media Gateway Control Protocol, okay, MGCP. And then the SIP also uses, I mean, for the multimedia sessions description, it uses what is called as the Session Description Protocol. Session Description Protocol in short form it is called as the SDP. So, SIP uses the SDP for the description of the session. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when I was saying that SIP as a protocol has got lot of similarity with the HTTP, okay. it is not only the text based uh, signaling, but also one of the major similarity which you will be finding is uh, the usage of the logical address okay, rather than the uh, 
IP address or the specific location specification, no specific location specification is actually required. Okay. I mean one can, uh, uh, one can use the, uh, I mean resource, that is uh, that's to say that one can use a logical address to do that and uh, in fact the usage of logical address, the greatest advantage that you come across for that is that the users okay, in the IP network, they can have a mobility, okay. just like the way that uh, uh, if you have an account in uh, uh, the Google mail, gmail.com or if you have an account in the Yahoo or any other uh, domain where uh, you have a webmail facility, okay, then no matter, I mean wherever you may be in the world, Okay, if you have uh, any internet access anywhere, okay, you can check your mail because your mail ID will remain the same universally okay, and you can log into this and you can get your email. So, but uh, and uh, the uh, people who are mailing you, okay, they will not be mailing you at any specific destination. Okay. They will just give you your mail ID, okay. they, will, they will know your email address, so they will just give your mail ID and then uh, your mail will reach you no matter wherever in the world you are. Okay. So, you have a mobility okay. and the same thing is expected whenever you are going to have a video conferencing because naturally, I mean uh, you cannot expect that in order to have a video conferencing, I will be sitting at one particular place. Okay. I mean uh, most of the times I may be in my office, but even, even then also I may have to travel out of office, I may have to um, um, leave the station and uh, go somewhere else and even then also I should be having a, a good, um, uh, I mean uh, all, all the facilities to enter into any video conferencing session. So, it should permit me that. So, uh, that is why instead of specifying the physical location, okay, the logical addressing scheme that works okay just like the way we do it for the um, uh, um, internets and for the emails okay uh, now sip as a protocol is not very old in fact it was established in uh, march 1999 okay and this protocol was actually uh, uh, published by the ietf the internet engineering task force okay i mean i have already mentioned about them okay they are the body who have uh, proposed all these uh, protocols or standards for the internet users and since its uh, publication in march 1999 there has been at least five or six major uh, modifications which uh, have been done and in fact i mean uh, the sip is uh, also an evolving protocol okay may, 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 i mean at least in the initial years it was more evolving and if you want to know about the uh, details of the current sip activities i mean one of the very useful resources that i can suggest for you is the columbia university website so you have to refer to http www.cs dot columbia dot edu and you should see their page on the SIP. So, that will give you a fairly uh, updated idea about what are the SIP activities taking place now. Now, just to give you a brief overview about the SIP, okay, there are four logical types of entities that participate in the SIP. Okay. The first is what is called as the user agents, okay. because the source or the destination, okay, they are referred to as the user agents. So, user agents are the ones that initiate the requests okay, and also the ones which uh, receive the requests and participate. So, this is, uh, so user agent's job is to initiate request and 
serve as the destination. Then we have the another important logical entity which are called as the registrars. Okay, in fact, it uh, uh, stipulates the usage of uh, registrar servers. Okay, because uh, the users must be registered within a domain. Okay, I mean just like the way it is there for any. Uh, internet applications that uh, you are uh, registered with one internet service provider okay and uh, uh, this this keeps track of the users within their domain so keeps track of users within their domain so like the like for example okay uh, iitkgp.ac.in okay you are registered within this domain okay so no matter i mean all who are present here as participants okay as the contact participants they are all registered with the iitkgp.ac.in okay uh, and uh, see this is very important because even if at one point of time you are not uh, directly connected to the iit kgp.ac.in server okay you should be locatable i mean if you have a webmail facility over the iit kgp.ac.in you should be locatable i mean your uh, mail can be accessed okay from any other server to which you are temporarily registered i mean you are temporarily having a login or you are you are having a login with another uh, server okay another isp okay even then also you should be able to uh, keep the contact so registrar keeps track of their own domain okay that's the purpose okay and then uh, another entity is obviously the proxy okay so proxies as you know that these are the application layer routers in fact uh, you all i mean if you have gone through the networking courses you must be knowing that uh, what the job of the proxy is in fact uh, all these uh, um, connection connection establishments okay that takes place in the client server mechanism okay that the user i mean when the user places a request you user agent places a request then uh, the user agent acts as the client okay and user agent this is a request to the proxy because you are i mean your first step of connectivity is the proxy okay so you are connecting to the proxy and then the proxy is uh, actually forwarding okay your request okay to the end destination or the proxy may contact another proxy okay in order to locate the destination okay so what the proxy does is that the proxy establishes the connection and then the proxy is actually um, uh, i mean the uh, i mean proxy is an entity which can serve as the client when it is uh, requesting or forwarding the request uh, request to the destination okay and uh, then other than proxies we also have what is called as the redirect servers okay the redirect servers actually what uh, the difference between the proxies and the redirect services is that uh, that the redirect servers will receive the request and it will return the location of another sip uh, user agent okay and uh, then it will be your botheration to establish the connection with that user agent okay uh, it does not establish the connection on its own whereas the proxy i mean whereas the proxy forwards that i mean proxy makes a request okay whereas the redirect servers only informs you about the location i mean it's, it's like i mean you just uh, call up an organization okay then uh, if you if you come across any uh, very uh, fr friendly operator or you uh, 
come across somebody uh, who is not the ultimate person to whom you want to speak to. Okay, if the person is friendly, he or she will tell that, uh, okay, I am connecting to his uh, number. Okay, so he will make the he or she will make the connection. Okay, and that will facilitate you to talk to the uh, end party. Okay, but uh, I mean at other times the person uh, to whom the call goes, uh, he may just tell you that, okay, please dial this telephone number. This is not the um, telephone number of the user to whom uh, you want to connect, okay, but his connection, his or her telephone connection number is this, okay. Although he, he, he could have connected, okay, I mean just taking little bit of extra pain, he could have transferred the call, okay, but some people, they do not want to transfer the call, but just tell you the number so that uh, you can ultimately contact. So, the, the redirect servers do like that, the, that the redirect servers will tell you the SIP address, okay, of the destination, okay, but do not establish the connection. Now, typical SIP session actually goes through like this, that uh, we have user agent, okay, who originates the call. Okay, and user agent is connected to a proxy, okay, and this proxy is in turn may be connected to several other proxies, okay. So I am showing this with a dotted line. This there may be more than one proxies, okay, or just one proxy may be enough, okay. Supposing if you are contacting, I mean, if you are let's say abc at iitkgp.ac.in and uh, you want to contact somebody who is xyz at the rate of iitkgp.ac.in. So, that means to say that both the user agents are in the same domain, okay. uh, one having the uh, login id as abc and the other is having the login id as xyz. So, they, they, they can be connected by the same uh, proxy. I mean, there only one proxy is enough because the domain name is uh, the same, okay. And uh, the last proxy, okay, to, to which the end users are connected, okay, one can have, I mean, uh, several uh, user agents, okay, who will be there, okay, as the end destination. So, this is, so, so these are the different user agents. So, this is a typical SIP session would involve these and uh, there are uh, six, uh, uh, five or six request methods, okay. There are, so the request methods that one uses, request methods for SIP, some of the SIP users. Uh, request methods I am mentioning. One is the register, register is a request method okay, that allows either the user or a third party to register contact information with an SIP server. Then the uh, initiation of the call signaling sequence is done by the message which is called as the invite. So, invite message that initiates the call signaling sequence, we will see an example, okay, that will make it very clear, okay. And then we have the acknowledgement when the actual end-to-end um, -end, uh, uh, connection is established, okay, and cancel, okay, and to terminate a session, okay, there is another message which is called as buy. 
So by terminates the session. Okay, just to show you a typical example. Okay, let's say that uh, connectivity with a single proxy. Okay, say ABC at itkgp.ac.in connected to XYZ at itkgp.ac.in. Okay, so only one proxy server is there. Okay, which is at the itkgp.ac.in. So there is a proxy server. This is an SIP proxy, of course. I mean, one can use the uh, same uh, computer as an SIP proxy and also for the IP proxy. And supposing there is one uh, party who is uh, here and there is another party, say this is ABC and let us say this is XYZ. Okay. And we will show the signaling sequence like this, okay, just in the, in the form of the timing chart that we prepared last time. And uh, ABC has got a uh, telephone. Okay, uh, telephone means we assume that this is an SIP telephone, okay, which will be having a handset, okay, and you can have a voice communication through that, and also you have a screen, okay, maybe a small LCD screen, okay, through which uh, you can see the other end's uh, picture also. So, it is a video conferencing facility in the sense that, I mean, it is a typical kind of video conferencing that one can have, a portable video conferencing equipment, okay, where, I mean, on a desktop <coughs> phone you are having the handset as well as the LCD screen to see the pictures, okay. And uh, uh, now, I mean, both are connected to the same domain, okay. And uh, uh, supposing ABC wants now to communicate with XYZ, okay. Now, XYZ is having an IP address, right. XYZ is connected to a computer where there is an IP address for them, but ABC need not have to remember that IP address, okay. Who remembers IP address after all, okay. Now, he may be either remembering the mail ID of uh, XYZ or since they are in the same organization, uh, they may not be even instantly remembering their uh, mail ID, okay. They may be remembering just the telephone number. So, either the mail ID or the telephone number is good enough, okay, in order to provide a logical address. Supposing XYZ's uh, telephone number happens to be 9876, okay, that is the internal telephone number that uh, XYZ is having. So, ABC can just say, okay, 9876, okay, he can uh, uh, just dial 9876 from his phone, okay, from his SIP phone and then uh, ABC's SIP phone, okay, has got an address book where it will convert that 9876 into 9876 at, let us say, iitkgp.ac.in, okay. And then it will uh, uh, forward this to the proxy server, okay. And then the proxy server has got a base, okay, a database where it can find out that, okay, 9876 is corresponding to XYZ, okay. Then, uh, I mean, it can uh, actually uh, get the IP address of, I mean, it can locate XYZ, that XYZ may be that time uh, logged in to the same proxy server, okay, and then it can locate uh, XYZ and, and it will have the IP address for that. So, it can forward the call, okay, to the XYZ. And so, the sequence of signaling would go through like this, that there will be an invitation. So, it says, an invite message, okay. And this is the first message that goes. So, every message is having some kind of a message identifier. So, let us say that we just say invite F1. F1 is a kind of a message identifier. The first message is F1 and we will call the second message as F2. So, what will be the second message? The second message will be that uh, from the proxy server to the end destination, okay there will be 
an invitation. So, now the proxy server invites x, y, z. Okay. So, this is invite and this is the message f 2. Now, when it uh, sends this invitation, okay, uh, the proxy server may not be sure that uh, whether uh, uh, the connection can be established or not, but at least it sends an acknowledgement to the source saying that it is trying. So, trying is another signaling message that it can give. So, trying and this is say the message F 3 where it uh, gives trying. Now, every message is also having a three digit number just like the way you have even for HTTP error 404, okay, the requested URL could not be found. So, that is error 404. So, like that every message has got say three digit number. So, say it could be 100 could be the type of the message. So, 100 trying F 3. Okay. And now, with the invitation, okay, now X, Y, Z uh, telephone has to get an alert. I mean, I mean it has to alert the uh, user X, Y, Z. Okay. So, it, uh, uh, so uh, the alerting is done through a ringing and when the connection is established, okay, that time the ringing, so the ringing is not only in this telephone, but the ringing has to be echoed back to the source. So, let us say that this is message 180. So, ringing this is F 4 okay, and this ringing will be forwarded to the source. So, here also we will be having a ringing. So, now uh, I mean uh, ABC knows that X, Y, Z phone is ringing. Okay. And now uh, X, Y, Z lifts his or her handset okay, or presses the speakerphone button okay. and then there will be and when uh, the actual button is lifted, okay, or, or, I, I mean the handset is lifted and the actual dialogue is going to commence, then you are going to send a message called OK. So, this is the message F 6. and again this will be forwarded by the proxy server. So, what the proxy server is doing is that I mean it is once acting as the client then again acting as the server and then this uh, becomes 200 OK F 7. Right. So, now uh, this is the signaling part is already done okay. and in fact I mean I should not have uh, drawn this line that long. Okay. Now, the uh, calling party that is ABC will send an acknowledgement. So, this is an acknowledgement. Now, this acknowledgement, so now an end to end uh, contact is there okay. and in fact, ABC's uh, telephone now knows the IP address of XYZ. Okay. Wherever XYZ is located, XYZ's IP address is now known and then uh, the acknowledgement is sent and then they can exchange their messages okay, or the data streams using the RTP media stream. So, this is the RTP media stream communication that will take place and then I mean one can uh, uh, and when the terminal uh, and when the session ends that time it has to send a by signal. Okay, uh, and then so by comes from the uh, called party to the caller, and then the by is again acknowledged. Okay, by saying the message OK. Okay, so this is 200 OK, which uh, will go from the ABC to the XYZ, and then the actual session will get uh, terminated. So, uh, this is the, uh, so this is a typical example using one proxy server and when one uses multiple proxy servers, okay, then, then it is just an extension of this and where multiple proxy servers could be required is that when especially the domain changes. Supposing ABC at IITKGP.ac.in wants to communicate to XYZ 
at IITB in IIT Bombay, say, IITB.ac.in. So now, uh, the IITKGP.ac.in, okay, they have to identify the proxy server of IITB.ac.in, okay, and uh, then only the connection can be established. So, uh, for IITB.ac.in, which uh, ABC will give as the email ID, okay, that it is XYZ at IITB.ac.in, and uh, now the uh, proxy server has to look for the DNS name lookup, that what does that IITB.ac.in actually means in terms of the IP address, and then the DNS happens to find out the IP address, and then the uh, call can be forwarded to the IP, uh, to the actual IP address of uh, the IITB.ac.in, so which will be the proxy for IITB.ac.in. So, it goes from IITKGP.ac.in proxy to IITB.ac.in proxy and then goes over to the XYZ. Okay, so, this is, uh, this is uh, just uh, an example of the SIP. So, in the next class, I will be concluding the other aspects of SIP. Okay. Uh, so, for, for this class, okay, thank you.